the name that's for children, about to enter Jewish life as full participants, are indeed our future. And today their breach, their promise, is our hope that Jewish life will be better, fuller, more interesting and enduring because these and other children have been encouraged to find and develop their voice and share it with us. And what you're going to see today is really these young women claiming the tradition for themselves, which when that happens, there's a greater likelihood that they're going to want to continue on that journey for a lifetime. And I, for one, am truly excited to see how their journey continues to unfold. The Torah tells us that humans were created in the image of God. We know that God is supposed to be all-knowing and therefore shouldn't make mistakes. However, if we often make mistakes, should God too? Did God realize that killing everyone wasn't a very good idea and therefore didn't do it again? Is that why there hasn't been another flood? The answer to some of these questions lies within the Parsha in chapter 8, verse 21. This quote shows us that God had second thoughts about what he did. He realized that he should have done something else to respond to the evil, as I suggested at the beginning. So God did think back about what he did, and even realized that he shouldn't have done that. I have had a, an amazing time in the British Teen program, and I've learned so much about what it means to be Jewish and how I can translate that into my own ideas. So, thank you. Abraham could have said no thank you to God and stayed where he was. I mean, God would probably have punished him, but at least he had a choice. What choice did Sarai have? She was a woman living in a man's world. Her husband takes her from her home and everything she knows to head to some unknown place. Then he gives her to Pharaoh, saying that she is his sister. What is that all about? Does he think he can do or say anything he wants just because Sarai, Sarai isn't a man? Maybe this was the custom back then, but this is so unfair. And frankly, kind of scary. Can you imagine your husband gives you to a king and says, she's my sister, here, take her, I'll take some cows and slaves and we're all good. <laughs> I couldn't figure any of this out, so I did what any thoughtful young biblical scholar would do. I Googled it. <laughs> I read that Pharaoh got punished for what he did. I read, quote, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his household with mighty plagues on account of Sarai, the wife of Abraham. And it says in the Midrash that when the angel of death was killing the Egyptians, he kept saying, Quote, this is because of Sarai, the wife of Abraham. And I also read that God made an example of the Egyptians because of what happened to Sarai. And just as Sarai loved and trusted Avram and agreed to his plan, I am putting my love and trust in my parents, my teachers, and my community. <laughs> something traditional, like a traditional bat mitzvah, um, I decided to lead a Passover ceremony with my grandpa. So um, this is the Haggadah that my grandfather and I used. Um, we took it out of a book um, and we kind of did some cutting and pasting of different stuff and we added um, what we thought was important and stuff like that. Um, a couple of other things I did in preparation, unfortunately I don't have pictures of this. Um, were that I took an adaptive design course um, offered here by the JDP program, um, which was really fun and interesting. Um, my partner and I de um, designed a, mod a modified version of a game that was in consideration of kids with disabilities. Um, another thing I did was at my bat mitzvah party, I made all the table center pieces out of pans and boxes of food, and then after the party, we donated them to my aunt's food pantry. Um, this is a picture of my grandpa and I at my bat mitzvah, and here's another, and thank you. 
Pueblo Passover has taught me many different things. I think that we take on a new meaning to it every year. This year, I had the privilege to look at the story in depth, and I think that um, the meaning I took away from it this year was an especially important one, that the story of Passover has shown me that we all should not only stand up for our own freedom and liberation, but for the freedom and liberation of others as well, regardless of their race, religion, where they come from, or any other thing that sets them apart from others. Because each and every one of us is different, and that's the one thing that makes us all the same. My Torah portion is about Shemot, and it takes place when the Hebrews are slaves in Egypt. The Pharaoh at the time was not a secure Pharaoh. He was always worried about the Israelites would make too many baby boys and would eventually overrule him and take away his power. In order to stop this, he made a law that all Hebrew baby boys would be killed. But the Hebrew midwives had another plan. They were listening to God and did not, God, not listening, not carrying out Pharaoh's requests. Pharaoh would have tortured, enslaved, or killed them, but he didn't. On some level, he knew he needed their help. Maybe Pharaoh was even afraid of God. This portion really affected me because I knew the story of Joseph in Egypt, and I also knew the ending of the Israelites when they were free. I was in a play in one of my courses for JGP, and I knew that the Hebrew babies and Pharaoh were scared, but I didn't know all the details. Basically, Pharaoh was telling midwives to murder their own people. That's crazy. And I really, and I'm really happy that they didn't obey Pharaoh's order because they they saved so many people's lives and their people's lives. I knew Pharaoh didn't was was mean, but I didn't know he would stoop so low as to force people to murder because he was scared. I was also surprised by the response of the midwives. I mean, usually servants follow their king's orders. They would knowing they knowingly took a huge risk, and I think that's brave and courageous. And I respect the midwives. <laughs> um, I want to see use the midwives as an example for doing what you believe in and what is right, even if you could be hurt. Sometimes it's worth the risk to save other people. So I want to call each of you up here together as a group. Come on up. You can stand right over here. So one of the things that happens at the end of Jacob's uh, journey is that his name gets changed to Yisrael. It gets, he goes through a transformation and then his name is changed into one who wrestles with God. And I like to understand the wrestling as engages, that our charge and our privilege and our challenge in life is to engage this life. And hopefully through that engagement we'll create closeness with one another and maybe something that's larger than ourselves. And I just want to say to each of you that you have brought the awesomeness into the Nora of the Makom, into the place that each of you took your story that could have been interpreted and could have been understood in many different ways and you made it your own and you shared yourselves through the story. You wove yourselves into the text and um, I hope you're feeling proud because I'm certainly feeling very proud of all of you and just want to say um, that it has been a privilege and a pleasure to sit with you and talk with you and learn with you. This Torah scroll goes from generation to generation and before we unroll it for all of us to see we're simply going to pass it from person to person, from grandparent to parent to, to bat mitzvah.
absolutely, that's what bat mitzvah is. That's what bar mitzvah is. It is stepping in, logging on to this story of the Jewish people and seeing themselves uh, in that story. And I have to say that it's been an incredibly hopeful morning for me as an educator, um, and I think for all the educators in the room, to see these young women take their place right in this story and understand it deeply.